A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. From today onwards, we are resuming the Hindu newspaper analysis. So, all we need from your side is support and love. So, today's date is 15th of May 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So, without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. Now, have a look at this text and context article. If you look at the title, you can find out that it is about the mitochondrial donation treatment, in short called as MDT. But the second half of the title is quite confusing, right? It says how a baby has three parents. Just think about it. Is it possible to have three parents? So that is what we are going to discuss. Meanwhile, we'll be seeing about what is this MTD also. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Now, first of all, you just think, is it possible to have three parents? When I ask this question, you might think about the egg or sperm donation. Yeah, that's right. When a child is born with the donated egg or sperm, then it has three parents. But that is not the article is about. It is specifically about MDT. In this case also, a baby has three parents. So what is this MDT? See as the name itself suggests, here mitochondria is donated. If you are asking why, let me explain. See in some cases mother might have mitochondrial disease. So to prevent the transmission of mitochondrial disease to the child, donated mitochondria is used. Mitochondria are a subunit in our cells. Mitochondria are present in almost all human cells including eggs. They create most of a cell's energy supply which powers every part of the body. They convert food and oxygen into energy. That is why they are called as the powerhouse of the cell. So for any cell to function, the mitochondrial genes need to work properly. So when the mitochondria malfunctions and stops providing energy, cells become damaged and they can even die. This will lead to the failure of organs and entire organ systems. Generally, mitochondrial diseases are caused by genetic mutations and are heritable. This means that they can be passed from parent to child. So to avoid this only, mitochondrial donation treatment is preferred. Know that our nuclear DNA comes from both egg and sperm. But the mitochondrial DNA is largely passed on from the mother through her egg. Here mitochondrial DNA is nothing but the gene that contains information necessary for mitochondria to function. So if a woman has dysfunctional mitochondria in her egg, she will pass on these disease causing mitochondria to all of her children. This is risky because the severity of the disease will vary depending on the healthy versus diseased mitochondria in the mother's egg. So mothers with the mitochondrial disease are nowadays opting for MDD. Now let us see how does MDT actually works. See in mitochondrial donation treatment MDT the mother's nuclear genetic material from an egg or oocyte with diseased mitochondria is transferred into a donor egg that has healthy mitochondria. In the donor's egg the original nuclear genetic material will be removed. So now after the transfer, the donor's egg will contain the mother's genetic material and the donor's mitochondria. This final product is then implemented in the uterus of the mother. The mother will carry it to full term to yield a baby. Here the healthy mitochondria in the donor egg allows for normal development and stops the transmission of mitochondrial disease. So the baby will be free from the mother's mitochondrial disease. So this entire process is only known as MDT. It is also known as mitochondrial replacement therapy or MRT. Now remember there are two methods to perform this MDT. One is called maternal spindle transfer or MST. The process we saw so far is this maternal spindle transfer only. In this method, mother's genetic material is transferred to the donor's egg. The donor's egg contains only the healthy mitochondria. The genetic material from the donor's egg will be removed. This is what we saw so far. Now the second method is called as pronuclear transfer or PNT. See in this method, mother's egg are fertilized with sperm in a lab to create embryos. 
the nuclear genetic material within each embryo is then transferred into embryos created using donated eggs and sperm from the sperm provider. Here also the nuclear genetic material will be removed from the donated egg. The only difference here is that in PNT method both mothers and donors eggs are fertilized and then genetic material is transferred. But note one similarity also here. In both the methods, mother's nuclear material is transferred to the donor's egg and donor's mitochondria is not transferred to the mother's egg. Remember this point. So overall in both MST and PNT, the resulting embryos or eggs contain the mother's and father's genetic material. Donor's genetic material will not be there. So the mitochondrial donor will not be the genetic parent of the resulting child. This is because the mitochondria that they provide makes up less than 1% of the child's genetics. For this reason, they will not have any legal rights or responsibilities over the child and they should remain anonymous also. Here you can note another one thing. Technical donor is not a genetic parent but they also contribute something for the development of the child, right? That is why the title said a baby with three parents. One of the major concerns with respect to MDT is that sometimes a small amount of the maternal mitochondria with errors may get passed on during the procedure. But experts are saying that MDT procedure is largely helpful but the procedure is not without these minimal risks. So MDT needs more research and development to avoid such risks. As per the article, UK government amended laws to allow the procedure in 2015. The article also said that Newcastle Clinic became the first centre to get a licence to perform MDT. The approval is given on a case-by-case -case basis by the UK's Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, HFEA. So that's all you have to remember about this news article discussion. In prelims, we had a question regarding this mitochondrial donation treatment. If you have time, go and look into that question also. So with this, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. The news is that yesterday around 23 persons were tested positive for COVID-19 in Tamil Nadu. Here the increase in the number of COVID-19 cases has driven several people to clinics and hospitals with requests for precautionary doses but most vaccination centers in the state have shut down. So the people in Tamil Nadu are struggling to get vaccinated. Even though the issue is not very important to the examination let us learn about different types of vaccines and how they actually work. First of all, know that vaccine can help us to protect against certain diseases by imitating an infection. This type of imitating an infection will teach our immune system to fight off against future infection. Sometimes after getting a vaccine, the imitation of the infection can cause minor symptoms like fever. Such minor symptoms are normal and it is the sign that our body builds immunity. Now coming to the types, see there are several types of vaccines like live attenuated vaccines, killed or inactivated vaccines, toxoid vaccines, viral vector vaccines, subunit vaccines, conjugate vaccines, mRNA vaccines and so on. Now let us restrict our discussion to the live alternated vaccine killed or inactivated vaccine, viral vector vaccine and mRNA vaccines. First, let us take live alternated vaccines. See, these type of vaccines can be able to fight against both viruses and bacteria. These vaccines contain weakened versions of the living virus or bacteria. As they are weakened, it does not cause severe disease in people who are with healthy immune systems. See, the live alternated vaccines are the closest thing to a natural infection. So, they are attributed as good teachers for the immune system. Examples of live alternated vaccines include measles, mumps and rubella, MMR vaccine and chickenpox vaccine. Now, moving on to see about killed or inactivated vaccines. See, these vaccines can also fight against both bacteria and virus. They are created by inactivating a pathogen, 
typically using heat or chemicals like formaldehyde or formalin. This process destroys the pathogen's ability to replicate, but the process keeps the virus or bacteria intact. So the immune system of our body can still recognize the virus or bacteria and develop antibodies. However, inactivated vaccines tend to provide shorter protection than live vaccines and they are more likely to require boosters to create long-term immunity. Covaxin and inactivated polio vaccines are some of the examples of inactivated vaccines. Now moving on to see about viral vector vaccines. See the viral vector vaccines use a modified version of a different virus as a vector to deliver protection. Several different viruses have been used as vectors which includes influenza, miasils virus and adenovirus that are known to cause common cold. Adenovirus is one of the viral vectors used in some COVID-19 vaccines. The COVID vaccines like Sputnik V, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca are some of the examples of viral vector vaccine. Now finally, let us take mRNA vaccine. See the messenger RNA vaccine in short called as mRNA or created using messenger RNA. It is nothing but a single stranded RNA molecule. The mRNA vaccine works by introducing a piece of mRNA into the human body. Here the mRNA is similar to that of a small piece of a protein found on the virus's outer membrane. By using this mRNA, the cells in our body can produce the viral protein. Subsequently, our immune system recognizes that the protein is foreign and it produces specialized proteins called antibodies. These antibodies in turn will help to protect the body against infection by recognizing individuals, viruses or other pathogens. The COVID-19 vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna are some of the examples of mRNA vaccine. So these are all some of the very important types of vaccines that you have to make note of. There might be a question in preliminary examination. So with these learned points, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this news article. It says the India Meteorological Department IMD has declared a heat wave in various regions of Maharashtra including Mumbai due to soaring temperatures. This is the fourth heat wave alert for the Konkan region and the first in May. It also says that the central Maharashtra, Marathwada and Vidarbha have been experiencing above normal temperatures for the past three weeks. So experts are emphasizing the need for heat action plans. This is the crux of the article given here. So in this context, we'll learn about heat waves. So what are heat waves? See, a heat wave is a period of abnormally high temperatures which is more than the normal maximum temperature that occurs during the summer season in the northwestern part of India. Know that heat waves typically occur between March and June and in some rare cases it can extend till July. So now we'll see what is the IMD criterion for declaring a heat wave. See, heat wave is considered if the maximum temperature of a station reaches at least 40 degrees Celsius or more for plains and at least 30 degrees Celsius or more for hilly regions. Also, to describe a heat wave, we look at two factors. Firstly, the departure of the maximum temperature from its normal state and secondly, the departure of the actual maximum temperature itself. In the first factor, that is deviation from normal state, here a heat wave occurs when the temperature departs from the normal range by 4.5 to 6.4 degree Celsius. But when the departure from normal exceeds 6.4 degree Celsius, we are facing a severe heat wave. Now the second factor, deviation from actual maximum temperature, here a heat wave occurs when the actual maximum temperature is above 45 degree Celsius and a severe heat wave occurs when the actual maximum temperature is above 47 degree Celsius. Then for coastal stations, a heat wave is declared if the maximum temperature deviates by a minimum of 4.5 degree Celsius from the average provided 
द मैक्सिमम टेम्परेचर एक्चुअली एक्सपीरियंस इज एट लीस्ट थर्टी सेवन डिग्री सेल्शियस सो दीज आर द क्राइटेरिया मेक नोट ऑफ दैम नाउ विल सी वॉट आर द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ हीट वेव्स सी फर्स्टली हीट वेव्स ऑफ बिकमिंग मोर फ्रीक्वेंट इन इंडिया स्टडीज शो दैट द नंबर ऑफ हीट वेव डेज हैज बीन इंक्रीजिंग एवरी डिकेड As time goes on, these heat waves are expected to spread to new regions, including the southern part of India. It's like the heat wave is expanding its territory, gradually reaching more places. Now, let us talk about a fascinating term called wet bulb temperature. See, in some parts of eastern India, the wet bulb is on the rise. It's like the air becomes heavy and damp, making it harder for us to cool down. it can cause discomfort dehydration and in severe cases even death so here you might have a doubt why increase in heat bulb temperature is so bad see our body has a self cooling mechanism which is sweating when we sweat the water in it evaporates because of the heat around us we know evaporation is a cooling process because it absorbs heat from the surrounding and uses this heat as energy to convert the water to vapor right since it reduces the heat from the particular area we call it a cooling process so this is how we dissipate heat from our body when we sweat now imagine the air is becoming heavy and damp so what will happen this evaporation process will not happen see the wet bulb temperature measures the temperature at which water evaporates from a wet surface like our skin under specific humidity conditions so basically high wet bulb temperature means sweating becomes less effective in cooling us down this can lead to heat related illnesses and heat stroke it is like wearing a wet shirt on a humid day the sweat on our skin doesn't evaporate efficiently and we feel even hotter and more uncomfortable so when it comes to health impacts heat waves can cause dehydration heat cramps exhaustion and even heat stroke here note that not only do heat waves affect our health but they also impact our finances the extreme health effects and diseases related to high temperature can lead to expensive medical bills also let's not forget about energy during heat waves the demand for electricity increases and as a result the cost goes up too it is basically making us pay more to stay cool so that's all regarding heat waves and its impacts make note of all the points with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Now look at this image from today's newspaper. It is a flock of flamingos that was sighted at Pulicat Lake near Chennai. Pulicat Lake is a very good example of brackish water ecosystem. So using this as an opportunity let us quickly revise about brackish water ecosystems. Now before that know that brackish water ecosystem is a type of aquatic ecosystem that is made up of shallow and partially enclosed areas. they are most commonly found near the coast of oceans or seas one of the distinct feature of brackish water ecosystem is that it contains a high amount of salt content than fresh water but lesser amount of salt content than the sea water the brackish water have the salt content in between 5 to 35 parts per million that is ppt these ecosystems are most commonly found in the areas where the fresh water meets the saline water know that the brackish water environments tend to change constantly this is because of the variation in salinity due to the tide and the amount of fresh water entering from rivers or rain and the rate of evaporation as a result of this variation in salinity many brackish water species are tolerant to the changes in salinity the prominent examples of the brackish water ecosystem include estuaries salt marshes and mangrove swamps Now let us see about them one by one with some example. See, an estuary is an area where a freshwater river or stream meets the ocean. In estuaries, the salty ocean mixes with a freshwater river, resulting in brackish water. Here, the tides create the largest flow of salt water in estuaries, while river mouths create the largest flow of freshwater in estuaries. 
In India, the estuaries occur along the coastal states where the river meets the sea. Kerala brackish waters, Pulikat Lake, Chilika Lake and Ennur Creek are some of the examples of estuaries. Now coming to the mangrove swamps. See the mangrove swamps are coastal wetlands that are found in tropical and subtropical regions. They are characterized by halophytic trees. Halophytic is nothing but salt loving trees. Then they are characterized by shrubs and other plants. These mangrove wetlands are often found in estuaries where fresh water meet salt water. Some of the examples of mangrove swamps in India include Sundarbans mangrove forest, Godavari Krishna mangrove, Bitarkanika mangrove and Pichavaram mangroves. Now finally let us take salt marshes. See the salt marshes or coastal wetlands that are flooded and drained by salt water brought in by the tides. They are marshy because the soil is composed of deep mud and peat. Here peat is nothing but the surface organic layer of a soil that consists of decomposed organic matter. The peat is derived mostly from plant material which has accumulated under conditions of water logging, oxygen deficiency, high acidity and nutrient deficiency. The Ran of Kutch is one of the ideal example of the salt marshes in India. So these are all some of the very important points that you have to remember about brackish water ecosystems. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this article from text and context page. It basically talks about millets, its nutritional value and how processing of millets affects the nutritional value. We'll try to understand all of that in this discussion. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. So what are millets? See, millets are a group of small seeded grasses that are cultivated as cereal crops for human consumption. It is particularly grown in the tropical parts of Africa and Asia. Some common varieties include pearl millet, barnyard millet, finger millet and foxtail millet. These crops have been cultivated in the Indian subcontinent for thousands of years and know that India is currently the largest producer of millets globally. So talking about the condition of growth, see they are drought tolerant, they are adapted to growing in warm weather and require low moisture and loamy soil but they don't grow well in water logged or extremely dry soil in a sense we can say that the millet or warm season crops they prefer temperatures ranging from 25 degrees celsius to 35 degrees celsius they are adapted to tropical and subtropical regions where the climate is hot so why this article talks about millets all of a sudden? See, of late, millets have gained popularity as a source of nutrition for several reasons. Firstly, they offer a range of nutritional benefits comparable to major food crops and in some cases, they even surpasses them. Secondly, millets are known for their ability to thrive in harsh and resource poor conditions. This makes them an excellent option for regions facing environmental challenges and food security issues. Now talking about their nutritional value, see the nutritional value of millet is very significant. They contain carbohydrates, proteins, fiber, amino acids and various minerals. Different millet varieties have different nutrient profiles. For example, if you take pearl millet, it has higher protein content than rice, maize and sorghum. Another example is finger millet. It has more crude fiber than wheat and rice. Also, millets are rich in amino acids, micronutrients and phytochemicals. So this makes them an important source of nutrition. Now let us quickly see the structure of kernel before understanding about the processing of millets. See if you take a millet kernel, you will find that it consists of three main parts. The pericarp, endosperm and germ. The pericarp along with the husk protects the kernel from unfavorable conditions, diseases and physical damage. The endosperm is the largest part and serves as the storage center for the kernel. It contains proteins, starch and B-complex vitamins. The germ is rich in oil, protein and ash as well as minerals. So these different parts contribute to the overall nutritional composition of millets. Now as we all know, millets are not sold as such after harvest. 
it actually goes through a lot of processing before it reaches your plate this is because processing can improve shelf life it can improve the taste and texture and most importantly it makes the kernel look very appealing for marketing purposes mainly removal of husk decortication milling and polishing or some process that are done so do you think these processes affect the millets in any way if you say yes you are right now this is what the article is trying to highlight also we'll understand it now see processing and polishing millets can affect the nutrient content of millets in various ways when the husk is removed phytic acid and polyphenol contents may decrease then cortication process which basically involves removing outer coverings this can also reduce the crude and dietary fiber however there is no doubt that this process also enhances the edibility and visual appeal of the grains as i told earlier such processed grains are attractive for marketing purposes then milling it is nothing but grinding the grains into flour and then sieving which is done to remove impurities including bran see these two processes can impact the nutrient content while sieving makes the flour more digestible and accessible to the body on the other hand it may lead to nutrient loss due to the removal of bran also when grains are milled for a longer time more protein fat and fiber contents are removed then you should know about polishing which is often performed as final step it refers to the process of removing the outer layers of the grain specifically the bran and the germ this is done to create a polished or refined product this process can also result in nutrient loss it basically leads to loss of essential nutrients like iron magnesium phosphorus potassium and manganese despite this nutrient loss polishing is desired for its impact on taste texture shelf life and consumer preferences now on the other hand know that there are processes like germination and fermentation these processes can actually improve the overall nutrient characteristics of millets so that's all you have to know about from this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw in detail about millets we saw whether they contain nutrient or not then we saw how the processing of millets affect their nutrient content so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news in numbers article from text and context page the article says that himachal pradesh government has made a proposal to cover 1800 hectares of land for orange production This has been done under the HP Subtropical Horticulture Irrigation and Value Addition in short called as Shiva project funded by the Asian Development Bank. So in this context let us quickly understand about horticulture and some of the important initiatives by the central government to promote horticulture in India. See the term horticulture is derived from two Latin words hortus meaning garden and cultura meaning cultivation. so it refers to crops cultivated in an enclosure that is garden indian agricultural sector stands in the midst of the horticulture revolution horticulture contributes 30.4 percentage of the agricultural gross domestic product using only 13.4 percentage of the gross crop area so now let's look into two important initiatives by the government of india to promote the horticulture in that firstly we will see about mission for integrated development of horticulture in short called as mitdh see mitdh was launched in 2014 it is a central sponsored scheme for the holistic growth of the horticulture sector covering fruits vegetables root spices flowers aromatic plants and bamboo since it is a centrally sponsored scheme when it comes to funding 60% of the cost is incurred by the union government and the remaining 40% is incurred by the respective state governments in case of north eastern and himalayan states the funding pattern is 90 is to 10 midh also provides technical advice and administrative support to state governments and state horticulture mission for saffron mission and other horticulture related activities like rashtriya krishi vikas yojana 
MIDH will integrate and subsume six ongoing schemes which includes three centrally sponsored schemes and three central sector schemes. You can have a look at them. Now let us move on to the next important scheme which is dedicated to the promotion of horticulture. It is nothing but the horticulture cluster development program. See this program is implemented by the National Horticulture Board. National Horticulture Board was established in 1984 based on the recommendation of the group on perishable agricultural commodities headed by Dr. M. S. Swaminathan. The headquarters of National Horticulture Board is in Gurugram. Okay? Now coming back to the program, see it is designed to leverage the geographical specialization of horticultural clusters. The Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare has identified 55 horticultural clusters of which 12 have been selected for the pilot launch of the project. Based on learning from the pilot project, the program will be scaled up to cover all 55 clusters. Here in this image you can see all that 12 clusters that have been selected for the pilot launch of the scheme. Remember for implementation of CDP, cluster wise cluster development agencies have been appointed based on the recommendations of the central and the state governments. So some of the key features of this scheme include capacity building of farmers for pre-production, then post harvest management and value addition and it includes logistics, marketing and branding. The expected outcomes from the scheme include development of cluster brands, 20% increase in exports, it is expected to be beneficial to 10 lakh farmers and it is expected to have ability to handle 80 lakh metric tons of produce. So that's all regarding this news article. In this news article discussion we saw in detail about what is horticulture, its current status. Then we saw two important schemes that are exclusively dedicated for the improvement of horticulture in India. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article here. It is about the bails granted to accused persons. Supreme Court have held that bail cases should not be too long and elaborate. Supreme Court said this because it violates the constitutional mandate of personal liberty which is guaranteed by Article 21. So this is what is given in today's news article. So in this news discussion, let us see about bail in prelims perspective. First of all, what is bail? See the concept of bail is a basic part of the Indian criminal jurisprudence. Bail refers to the provisional release of the accused in a criminal case in which the court is yet to announce the judgment. So it is granted before the judgment. See usually bail is given on the condition to deposit some security. This is done to ensure the person's return at the required time. Here security may be cash or property papers or bonds of private persons. If the bailed person do not return at the appropriate time then the security subsumed by them will be forfeited. Know that courts have greater discretion to grant or deny bail in the case of persons under criminal arrest. Now coming to India specific information, see as far as laws are concerned, the term bail is not defined in any legislation. But in Criminal Procedure Code 1973, the terms bailable offence and non-bailable offence are defined and generally there are three major types of bail. First one is the regular bail. See, regular bail is frequently issued to any individual who has previously been arrested and detained by police. The accused has the right to be freed from such confinement under section 437 and section 439 of the CRPC. Second one is interim bail. See, it is a bail issued for short period. Interim bail is granted to an accused before the hearing for regular or anticipatory bail. So what is this anticipatory bail? It is another type. Here, if a person suspects that he may be arrested for non-bailable offence, he may petition for anticipatory bail. In recent years, this has become an important problem because corporate competitors and other prominent persons sometimes seek to frame their opponents with fake charges. 
it is similar to obtaining advance bail under section 438 of the CRPC. So these are all some of the important facts that you have to know about bail and its types. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. It says that the southwest monsoon is expected to reach the Andaman Sea by May 20 and it is going to cover the entire Andaman and Nicobar Islands on May 22. Then the monsoon is likely to reach Kerala by June 1 with an error margin of plus or minus 5 days. The article further says that the countdown for the arrival of the monsoon has already begun with the formation of high pressure area called Mascarinas High near Madagascar. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly revise about southwest monsoon. See, first of all, know that monsoon refers to the seasonal reversal in the wind direction during a year in between winter and summer seasons. In India, there is a double system of seasonal winds which causes two different monsoon patterns. The monsoon patterns are firstly the southwest monsoon. During the southwest monsoon, the wind blow from the southwest and it flows from sea to land during the summer. Then secondly, the northeast monsoon. During the northeast monsoon, the wind flows from the northeast and it flows from the land to sea during winter. Also remember that monsoons are experienced more in the Indian subcontinent compared to any other region and this is due to various factors. We will see about them one by one. Firstly, favorable geographical location at the southern edge of the Asian continent. Secondly, the Tropic of Cancer passes through the Indian subcontinent. Thirdly, the vast Indian Ocean lies south of the Indian subcontinent. Fourthly, strong land-sea thermal contrast especially during summer exists in India. And finally, the presence of the Himalayan mountain barrier along the northern boundary of the Indian subcontinent. So these are some of the common factors that are contributing to the monsoons in the Indian subcontinent. Now since the news is about southwest monsoon, let us see few more facts about southwest monsoon. See, southwest monsoon season falls between June to September. During southwest monsoon, the wind flows from sea to land during the summer. This is due to the differential heating of land and sea. We know that during summer, the northwestern parts of India become very hot due to very high temperature, right? This is mainly due to the apparent shift of the sun in northern hemisphere. Now, due to higher temperature over the land in summer, a low pressure area develops over the land. So, the wind blows from neighboring oceans towards the land. And since these winds are of maritime origin and are blowing over warm water bodies before reaching land, they are moisture laden. This in turn causes ample rainfall in summer. The sudden onset of rainfall is called break of monsoon or the burst of monsoons. This is why southwest monsoon period is the chief rainy season for whole India. Know that about 75% of the country's annual rainfall is realized during southwest monsoon season. You know that the arrival of these winds may be early or delayed. It depends upon the pressure conditions over northern plains and over the Indian Ocean. So these are all some of the facts that you have to remember about southwest monsoon. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at this first question about brackish water ecosystem. Four statements are given and you have to choose which are the characteristics of brackish water ecosystem. Statement 1 low salinity than the sea water. Statement 2 presence of marshy soil with peat and mud. Statement 3 high salinity than the fresh water and statement 4 presence of halophytic plants and shrubs. See if you have listened to our discussion clearly you could easily answer this question. Here the correct answer for the question is option D 1, 2, 3 and 4. All are the characteristics of brackish water ecosystems. Now moving on, this question is about heat waves and the question is asking us which of the following is or are the causes of increasing heat waves in the Konkan coast. Statement 1, hot and dry wind from northwest India. 
second statement slow movement of sea breeze along the maharashtra coast statement 3 clear sky condition yeah four options are given option a one only option b two only option c one and two only and option d one two one three See, Konkan, including Mumbai, is currently experiencing heat wave condition due to multiple factors. That is what we saw in today's news article, right? One of the key contributor is the direct influence of the ongoing heat wave in the neighboring Saurashtra Kutch region of Gujarat. The hot and dry wind blowing from northwest India are reaching parts of Konkan, and it is intensifying the heat. Furthermore, the slow movement of the sea breeze along the Maharashtra coast exacerbates the situation. Additionally, the overall clear sky conditions prevalent in the area contribute to the heat wave because they allow for increased solar radiation and heat accumulation. So all these factors are responsible for heat waves in Konkan coast. So the correct answer here is option D one two one three. Now moving on, look at this question about bail. Two statements are given. Statement one: The term bail is defined under Criminal Procedure Code 1973. See, this statement is actually incorrect. We saw that in the discussion itself, right? The term bail is not defined in any legislation. Even the Criminal Procedure Code 1973 mentions the term bailable offence and non-bailable offence. Only they both are defined. So, the first statement is actually incorrect. Now look at the second statement. Bails are not granted to non-bailable offences in all cases. See, this statement is also incorrect. Section 437 of Code of Criminal Procedure, 1973, lays down that the accused does not have the right to apply for bail in non-bailable offences. But this does not mean that he cannot apply. He can apply, but it is not a right. So, in such cases, it is discretion of the court to grant bail in case of non-bailable offences. Here, court takes into account a lot of factors. One such factor is gravity of the case. For example, if the offence is serious and punished by death or life in prison, the chances of securing bail are lower. So, this statement is incorrect. So, here the correct answer for the question is option D, neither one nor two. Now, look at this question about National Horticulture Board. Two statements are given. Statement one: It is a statutory body established based on the recommendations of Group on Perishable Agricultural Commodities. See, even though the second half of the question is actually correct, the first half it says it is a statutory body, right? No, it is not a statutory body. It is registered as a society under Society Registration Act, and it is not established by any law. So obviously, it is not a statutory body. So the first statement is actually incorrect. Now look at the second statement. NHB has 29 field offices located all over the country. Say so this statement is actually correct. So here the correct answer for the question is option B two one D. Now the two questions displayed here are the prelims quiz question for you today. If you have listened to our discussion carefully, you can easily answer the questions displayed here. So post the correct answer in the comment section below. And moving on, the two questions displayed here are the mains practice questions for you today. Just go through the questions, try to write an answer, and post that also in the comment section. So with this, we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment, and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Now thank you so much for listening.